Give me a second. No sound. Can you fix it? That means Pete has to tell his joke again. No, I don't. Damn it. Hey, whatever you've got above your head, Bridget, I've got one to the right of my head. Oh, they hear us now. You guys hear us now? Oh, like the um, the light? The, yeah, there? the top. Yeah. All right. Good now. All right. We're, we're good now. Um, all right. Pete told a very yeah. terrible dad joke. Do we have to repeat that or? I don't know or, about the adjective. Are good? Terrible. It's, it's acceptably good. Do you know when a dad joke becomes a joke becomes a dad joke? When it's funny. No, when, when the it becomes joke a parent. Is a parent. <laughs> I think you should write a short story, uh, Pete, called "The Terrible Old Goat." All right, let's do let's do introductions. Let me just say before we do that, uh, for anyone watching who's new, uh, listen. If you don't want to watch live. You can watch later, of course, at the same link. Um, the advantage of watching live is that you get to text chat with us, which is is uh, depending on who you are, nice or not nice. So, you know, I don't know. Um, it, the other thing is, is that I convert this to a regular audio only podcast a few days later. And I put it on iTunes and I, I link to it in the group and other places on Twitter uh, you know, if you subscribe to Lovecraft Easy Podcasts on Spotify or iTunes, you know, the new episodes will pop up for you. And all you got to do really is just Google um, Lovecraft Easy Podcast. If you do that now, you'll see last week's audio version. So for those of you who want to listen in your car and all that kind of stuff, you, you do have that option. Um, let's do introductions. Uh, Pete, Rollick, and Pete talk, Rollick. About, talk about your group. No. Oh, okay. So Mike wants me to plug my, my other Facebook group, which is the Arkham book exchange where I and others, for money. we dispose of things that, you know, we find or don't need anymore. I think I might be sending you more books. <laughs> Danielle's going to love this. She will love that. Yeah. But yeah, you, you know, and you know, look, I, I make a smidge of money out of it, but really it just funds my habit. What is, are the, is that a new platinum ring? <laughs> is yeah, that a new see? boat and out your Is that a new boat out your window there? Actually, um, my wife has made it very clear that this has to fund my trip to Portland in October. So I sure as hell. Are we, hope are we we're gonna going. have a trip to Portland in October? I would I can't see why not. I hope so. Uh, make sure I have uh, coverage. Right. Live group, you know, as, as you know, we're still in the beginning stages of all this uh, this uh, tech change. So um, let us know if there's no sound. Uh, let us know if there is sound. Let us know if Matt does something or says something weird, you know. So. Yeah, so, so yeah, basically the Arkham Book Exchange is, you know, people mostly, I, I did it to clear out my stuff, but other people can post as well. We just post pictures of our book and, you know, say this is what I'm looking for. And people hold negotiations and we sell stuff. Yeah. So cool. if you go to Facebook and type in Arkham Book Exchange, you'll find the group. Yes. And you'll see you'll see Pete often type, what can I do to, to sell you this book today? You know, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, it's low truth, pressure. The truth is I have a problem. I love to go to book sales. Which one are we talking about? I love to go to book sales. All right. And you no, know, I stock my own collection that way. But every once in a while, more often than not, I find stuff that I already have that I know other people are looking for. There you go. And, you know, as long as my gas and, and, and out of pocket is covered, I'm pretty happy. Bridget. Yes. Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, composer, artist, horror fan. Well, aren't you going to be going to Disney also becoming a princess? You are? <laughs> no, I'm definitely not. BridgetBrenmark.com. She makes some pretty cool stuff. I, th I um, thought you were going to be like a 
Disney thing. Matt, you need to either up or lower your medication. <laughs> Rick. Rick Lay, writer and pulp magazine collector. And I have to take a quick break. No problem. Uh, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi. I'm going to have two prizes today sent as one. It was a series of anthologies called Crypto Critters from about four or five years ago. So this is both of the anthologies, Crypto Critters 1, Crypto Critters 2. Do you want to win these? Of course you do. Send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put crypto in the subject heading. In about five weeks or so, we will have a random drawing to choose a winner, and maybe it could be you. Uh, uh, I don't think what... I don't think you improve your chances if you mail me an entry taped to a twenty dollar bill, but you know, could happen. Can't hurt, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for providing those prizes uh, every week. And if you're listening later, like a week later, you still have time. Matt, Matt, choose randomly chooses the winner like a couple weeks later, right? So yeah, I usually give it at least a month. Okay. So everyone has a so, chance to yeah. send in an entry. So you do have time. So and uh, that includes it, panelists. We have what? Have, we can win stuff? I, I didn't know this. Some great books from Matt. What's oh, that? Wow. I have won some great books from you. Huh. I just like he holds up a prize and I'm like, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You're giving that away to somebody else? No. <laughs> All right, I'm Mike Davis, Love Craft Easing. Uh dishwasher um everything else um podcast uh what do we what else do we do public we publish books edit all that kind of stuff talk about horror um my background my my wonderful son is letting me use his really neat green screen and i am loving this stuff so if i can move here you can see that the background there's a monster trying to get out of the closet and get me there. And this is provided by Cinema Mind, as in cinema, as in film, cinemamind.tumblr.com. There's a lot of cool stuff there, so check it out. And I did link to it in the in the show notes. So, um, and I also have a link, a link tree link in the show notes to everything that you might want to do, including the Patreon. So, um. Richard Chismar was going to be on the show today, but selfishly, he's going to attend his son's college graduation instead. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know we just got some... how much it's like, why wouldn't he celebrate that? Because it's like tomorrow. It's like he's getting a huge raise. Yes. Yeah, that's that. That's true. Yes. That's true. Anyway, I, I kid about Richard Chismar, of course. Um, we uh, rescheduled him for August 8th, which is even better because Chasing the Boogeyman uh, comes out on August the 17th. Now, you can go ahead and, and pre-order it at Amazon and I imagine other places. This is kind of a meta book. Um, this is like the third book I've seen, and I haven't even really been looking in the last several months about killers in you know smaller medium towns in the 80s so um the protagonist of this book is a guy by the name of richard chismar so i'll leave it at that um and we'll we'll talk to him on august the 8th so uh another book that was like that is uh that was set in my hometown is called the monsters we make by callie white She's going to be on later in the year. And uh, you guys, you guys may remember the Johnny Gosh and new, new, uh, the paper boy that went missing in Des Moines, Iowa in the, in the mid eighties. Um, you know, Des Moines by and large is a, is a pretty, what was, was he, pretty was safe. He the 11 year old kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she wrote kind of a fictional version of this. She's from the area as well uh, as I am. And at the beginning of the book, this is this is it really pulls me into the story. She's writing a fictional version of this, but here's here, here's a blurb from the 
Des Moines Register at the time, August 15th, 1984, uh, by James P. Gannon, editor. So now the national media, the television networks, and the national press are fascinated with the unlikely tale, terror in Des Moines of all places. We are on display, each one of us, bit players in a drama that examines what's wrong in a place that's supposed to be so right. So, you know, if Chasing the Boogeyman um, by Richard Chismar looks interesting to you, uh, it doesn't come out till, the August, till August 17th. So, but uh, uh, The Monsters We Make by Callie White, K-A-L-I, is available now. Actually, it's available at $1.99 on Kindle right now. So I don't know how long that will last. So... Plus, I found out something I didn't know about my hometown, guys. There are tunnels everywhere under Des Moines or in many places. Tunnels. Why? Abandoned mines. Okay. Abandoned coal mines, I guess. Hmm. So, anyway. You hope all right. Abandoned. What? You hope they're abandoned. Yeah. There, unfortunately, are probably a few uh bodies in there so all right let's start with robin Chang. um we got some movies to discuss uh to discuss shutter 2004 pete i really appreciate you turning me on to this movie i watched it the other night and i loved it i was blown away uh we'll talk about that in a little bit we're going to talk about a new found footage uh movie called horror in the high desert which pushes all my buttons um but for now robin chang says questions for rick and the group could a little time be spent on the iconic film starring lon chaney the phantom of the opera uh, and then she discusses that she thinks there's a 20 25 version 1925 version and a 1929 version so rick um rick's the expert on that yeah, yeah Rick is muted right now. I've just asked him to unmute. So I'm back. All right. Yeah, go ahead and talk uh, about that. The 1925 and 1929 version. The 1929 version is a sound uh, attempt to oh. dub over the dialogue. Okay. That's that's when it's two versions, but that's kind of lost. Probably didn't work out that well. Now, uh, Phantom of the Opera is based on a novel written around 1910, 1911 by a French writer named Gaston LaRue. And the Phantom in that novel is this guy who was born deformed with a skeletal face. And he runs off runs away from home, from, he was born in, in France, and he runs away to uh, the Far East. He probably uh, takes aboard a ship. And he ends up somehow getting involved with uh, Indian stranglers, Indo-Chinese pirates, and the Royal Court of Persia, or Iran as it's now known. And he ends up becoming an assassin and an architect and builds a palace for the Shah of Persia. But uh, it has all these secret passages and the Shah of Persia doesn't want anybody who knows about the secret passages to be alive, so uh, a police official is ordered to kill the Phantom, but the police official lets the Phantom go. So he escapes back to uh, Paris around the start of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, 1871. And they were building a, an opera house right before the war. And he becomes sort of a contractor to build the foundations. There is a, there is, the opera house really exists. And during the war, he secretly, uh, all construction is suspended officially, but he secretly constructs a little uh, 
secret home for himself. He's wearing a mask in the society at this point, uh, telling some probably false story about how he got this thing in the war or something. Uh, let me jump in really fast, Rick, and interrupt you and say, after we talk about this, we're going to discuss White Chapel, White Chapel briefly with Pete. But something you just said, and I won't say what, figures in another episode of White Chapel, and I think you'll really like it. Okay. So, go ahead. So, he secretly builds his sanctuary and is living under the uh, opera house. And he falls in love with a uh, woman who's studying to be an opera singer who is sort of the understudy for the main star. And he uh, contacts her and pretends to be a ghost and trains her to sing. And uh, then uh, he starts to get, uh, she can't advance in, uh, in her career. So he starts to blackmail the uh, opera house managers to give her parts by uh, committing acts of murder and terrorism. And that is sort of where the classic story uh, begins. She's in love with a French lieutenant and he starts to go after him and it gets complex. Now the movie version with Lon Chaney, they don't go too much into the Phantom's background. They say something about it being an escapee from Devil's Island in South America, but uh, that's all you get. And in later movie version, the story, there was one with Claude Rains made around, I think, 1940, in which you get the idea that the family opera was disfigured by acid. That then pops up in the 1962 movie version with Herbert Lobb that Hammer Films did. Acid, is there a influence on Two-Face with this, do you think? And it's a little yeah. on the nose, but... Um, it's kind of close as to when the two face happened, because mm. the uh, you have to check the dates for when the Claude Rains movie was made and when the uh, two face first appeared. Well, it would have been after thirty nine mm. for sure. Yeah, I, I know. It's I'm just saying it's the dates are close. <laughs> okay. Sometimes dates get a little too close, and you can't justify it. Yeah. May, have, may have influenced Two-Face. All right. I think what influenced this, uh, Two-Face got influenced by a drawing uh, from one of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movies where they had a game of a split face. Two-Face is uh, 1942, first appearance. Oh, thanks, Pete. <laughs> and we would need to know, the. could you look up the Claude Rains uh, family opera movie? Mm-hmm. She would also like to know what's the best English translation of Leroux's novel. <coughs> if, if, if the one put out by Black Coat Press. Okay. All right. Because they uh, add pet, they translate passages that were uh, deleted from the original English translation. All right. Anything else you want to say about it? Just that I've written a sort of sequel, a series of sequels to the Phantom of the Opera called uh, Shadows of the Opera, which is based there. The, the novel has a couple of mysteries which are not resolved. Of course, Gaston LaRue seems to be a little careless in his writing. And there seems to be some other woman in the Phantom's life besides the opera singer who's uh, attending. Uh, opera performances with him in a box which he has blackmailed the managers to reserve for him. If you've seen the musical, they do have a, they do have an explanation for a woman aiding him, but she's uh, not doing that in the book. That character, that Madame, Madame Geary, who was sort of a... The uh, 1943 Claude Rains, the Claude Rains is 1943. 
which so, means two faces was before. Yes. All right. Anything else you want to say about Phantom? And just the other thing is, besides that mystery of the woman, there is a mysterious character called the Shadow, who is sort of the Phantom's neighbor in the <laughs> novel. And you don't know who this Shadow is. There's a Turk also, right? The there's the uh, police official who I mentioned earlier didn't kill him. Is called the Persian. The Persian, that's right. And he moves to France, and he's sort of spying on him and wondering what he's doing in the opera house. And he gets hooked up with the uh, hero of the novel, uh, the fiance of the opera singer. So I was going to talk about this anyway. By the way, Robin says thanks, Rick. So. Yeah, and Pete, I was going to talk about Whitechapel anyway, and this is a great um, segue into it. Whitechapel is mid to late two uh, thousands, uh, four season detective story set in in Whitechapel, you know, London. Uh, really good show. I really liked it, but I specifically want, as without spoilers, for Rick to tell us about. Uh, it's season three, episodes five and six, where a killer escapes prison, a guy who murdered his family. And do I have this, am I rem remembering this right, that he's guarding a movie that may or may not exist that's supposed to drive you mad called London After Dark? Yeah, he has a, co he has a, con a copy of London After Midnight. London after, London after midnight. Is it? Oh, is it midnight? All right. I, I haven't seen this at all. Okay. London after midnight is a lost film by Lon Chaney, mm -hmm. which was later remade into Mark of the Vampire with Bela Lugosi. And, and if and if you've seen Mark of the Vampire, you get a pretty good idea of what the plot is of London after midnight. Yeah, and obviously a silent movie, right? Right. It deals with vampires. It has a twist, which you probably figure out, which I'm not going to spoil. Well, in, 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 in the um, surviving stills of the movie, you see Lon Chaney Jr. as a vampire where he's got a, um, a skeletal face similar to the Phantom of the Opera. He's got vampire teeth that are not just the canines pointed, all the teeth are pointed. Right. Hmm. Sort of like the Count Yorga movies, if you ever saw them in the 70s. And he's wearing a top hat and a black cape. Right. It, it, when I sort of saw, I always thought he was a, 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 a Mr. Hyde kind of character, you know, as a kid, because there was, you always saw the picture, but you never had an explanation of what the film was. Right. Well, the killer in this movie, uh, this is a very mild spoiler, but does actually have a copy of London After Midnight, you know. So it's yeah. just a really interesting episode, and there's a reason why he loves the film. One of the, the one of the main reasons is because it's a silent film, right? And he hates noise, right? Right. Um, but that whole episode, you know, there's um. There are scenes of a killer moving through the city that seem very reminiscent of the cabin of Dr. Caligari. Um, That's a good point. You know, it, it draws heavily on that sort of, what's the, what's the term I'm looking for for that style of, of filmmaking, Rick? Um, Avant-garde, existential, surreal. I think it's surreal. Surreal, yeah, so surrealism. Um, there's also, you know, a, f a couple homages um, in the film, or in the episode to, I would say, the Saw series, is it because there's some um, complex traps. And then the very ending seems to just draw straight from Psycho. Um, with with the the killer's mother um i i enjoyed every 
season of of Whitechapel in and especially the five uh, season th season three episodes five and six what you were just talking about and then in the fourth season it starts to dip a little bit into the supernatural right. or is it you know right. which I which I love and I love that that's anyone who watched this will know what I'm talking about I love that spy guy that's been keeping an eye on the squad for three or four years now since they started yes. so it's just a really cool way to go i really enjoyed season one which was uh, focused on jack the ripper yeah jack the ripper uh, uh, someone who's repeating the jack the yes. ripper movie. right season two was about the cray brothers um that's my life. least favorite season and th i didn't enjoy that one they're yeah. real life gangsters. They're, yes. Real yeah. life Season gangsters. two was my least favorite. I have to agree with that. Right. It was played by uh, Tom uh, Hardy. In, uh, in the film. Yeah, the great in, in the film. Uh, tw twin criminals. Right. Season three kind of breaks the mold because they stopped doing entire story arcs for the whole season. I think there's three or four story arcs in season three. Yeah. And each um, of them are two episodes. Right. And then season four. Look, I really enjoyed season four. But in some ways, it jumps the shark. Oh, of course. Um, I think basically they were told, hey, you've got one season to wrap this up. Give us something. And they bring in a supernatural element and then they back fill some, some things as, oh, well, that explains all this stuff that we didn't explain in seasons one through three. Some of the earliest scenes in season four is, uh, forget the guy's name in the show, but the actor Phil Davis, the number two yeah. on the squad. Really like that guy. He, you know, he keeps, they're, they're police, by the way, they're, the squad is located in this really <laughs> God gothic building you know which isn't i guess much of a surprise in london but some of the, the creepiest scenes that he keeps hearing footsteps throughout the hallways and trying to figure out if he's being chased or who it is or whatnot it's it's done really well yeah and there it ends up being there's a i don't want to spoil it for anybody but one of the, the fundamental problems that his this, this squad has is that in three seasons, they've never captured any of these killers alive. Right. Which to them is a big deal, and I don't see why it is. Right. You know, they, they've caught them. They've stopped them. But management, their, their bosses, aren't pleased that they've never brought in anybody alive. And yeah. uh, so it, it becomes sort of this white horse. You know, we have to, we have to do it. We have right. to catch these guys alive. And of course they can't. And they, they get this idea that they're cursed. And it actually goes beyond the fact that it, they're not cursed. They're being worked against. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, anyway, it's a really good show. Um, London okay. After Midnight is, go ahead. You know, you mentioned Phil Davis, and yeah, you know, I've been watching Phil Davis on Whitechapel. He's in New Tr New Tricks. Um, he's been in several episodes of Midsummer Murders. He was in the uh, first episode of Sherlock. Sherlock, yes, he's the the cabbie in Sherlock. Mm -hmm. I have watched him. You know, I've because I, you know, I watch a lot of BBC and I watch a lot of old BBC. I have watched this guy grow old. Um, I so, love him, and I think he's a great actor. And I think he, he he's hardly he's not well used. I think he's a great actor, though. So, so anyway, to the audience, watch Whitechapel. Um, Robin, thank you for the for the great questions. Um, yes, Travis, Chelsea, Bronzo, everybody, thanks, thanks for watching live. All right, Cody Goodfellow has a new book coming out. Oh, uh, as you know, 
all of Cody Goodfellow's books are incredibly boring uh, and no one should ever read them. Um, and I mean, what I mean by that is the opposite of what I said. You never know what you're going to get when you when you read Cody Goodfellow. And this one looks just great. I've already pre-ordered it and you should too. It comes out in two days. It's only it three ninety nine on Kindle and it's called The Flying Nun, spelled N-O-N-E. Okay. Let me just read the synopsis briefly. Uh, Gayla Murawski wasn't really looking for God when she joined her local nunnery. Okay. But when an, an ecstatic out-of-body experience sets her spinning through a godless cosmos, she becomes an avenging angel on a rogue crusade against the hypocrites who prey on the innocent in his name. Believing only in herself, Gayla proves that while faith may move mountains, only doubt dethrones douchebags. Yes, that's actually in the synopsis. But her reign of unholy terror makes her an outlaw and plays into the hands of fanatics hell-bent on making her into the deity that she doesn't believe in and a tool to remake in their image. I have no idea where he's going with this, and that synopsis just captured me from the get-go. So, um, you know, Cody's, Cody's a really great writer, and Cody doesn't get near enough the recognition that I, I truly feel he deserves. Um, so, you know, it's available in paperback as well, but if, if you got a Kindle, you can go ahead and pre-order it too. It's only three ninety nine, so it'll pop up on your Kindle uh, on Tuesday, May twenty fifth. So, uh, you guys, want to say anything else about Cody? Um, there's probably a pretty good chance he'll be at the film festival. Is there going to be a film on the festival? West Coast? Well, we're 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 hoping. Yeah. You know, we still have a few months to figure it out. Uh, like Pete said, he's trying to fund his through shilling books. Um, I'm just selling plasma. Well, as Superman said, hope is the light that lifts us out of darkness and into the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. There you go. So, um, all right, let's talk about this. I came across this today, and I'm going to watch this tonight. I sent you guys this link earlier. Um, not the audience, but the panelists. A uh, horror exclusive interview, Horror in the High Desert, director on making found footage scary again. Now, I'm not a fan of, of found footage. I am a fan of faux documentaries like um, Lake Mungo and uh, what was the other one that Rich recommended to us? Savage Land. Savage Land. Savage Land is very good. Uh, Lake Mungo is very good. Um, and I know one of you sent an article that has some other words and we'll cover those too um i'm not going to read this whole interview but the director is dutch merrick i hope i'm saying your name right dutch um plus he can he, he confirmed that a sequel is now in the works it looks like you can watch this for free on tubi folks okay which is exactly what i'm going to do when i'm done talking with everybody tonight i'm gonna sit on the couch and watch horror in the high desert I mean, it hits a couple of buttons for me. You know, desert, horror. Um, high deserts. Yeah. They're, yeah. Getting high on the desert. Is that what you mean? No, just high deserts. High deserts, right. Um, I don't like low deserts. Let's see. Uh, he says, Dutch says, my golden rule with this movie was to keep everything as realistic as possible. The mockumentary approach lends itself to total realism, which to me means leaving some questions unanswered is not only acceptable, but bolsters the realism. Um, I, I think that's all I'll read about that. I, I just, I'm going to, I'm ex let me put it this way. I'm excited about this and I'm sick of found footage. And I don't, I don't know if this is going to end up in my mind as seeming like found footage or seeming like more like uh, Lake Mungo and a foe and Savage Land. I don't know. I'll just, I'll see tonight, I guess. Well, I'm thinking about uh, after re re hearing about that, I'm going to add it to the list of possible easy movie night movies. Yeah. For those who don't know, um, Matt hosts um, Lovecraft easy movie night every Saturday 
at yeah, uh, 8, it, 8 30 central time it, it's quite a bit of fun if you like horror movies but don't get the chance to watch many on your own like people like brian sammons or bridget grenmark who watch thousands and thousands of horror movies every year <laughs> they've probably seen everything already but uh all you have to do is download the application cast k-a-s-t it's best done on a laptop rather than a phone you request to join the movie. The uh, It's called The Party. Their groups are called Parties, uh, Easy Movie Night. And I will accept you, although I only check it maybe once a week, but you'll, you'll get brought in. Starting at about 8.15 Eastern time on most Saturdays. That's Eastern or uh, Central? Oh, um, 8.15 Central time U.S. Okay. I'll open the party. And lately what we've been doing is listening to the BBC Whisper and Darkness presentations are about to switch over to the shadow over Innsmouth. And the movie will start about 9 p.m. Um, I'm trying to get together a photo album of all the movies that we've seen over the years. Uh, I've posted it on the Easing webpage on Facebook and my Facebook page. If you happen to think of a movie that we've watched that I haven't included, please just let me know uh, so I can get us a good list. And the other thing is, if you look at this, what we've watched, you kind of get an idea of the movies that we aim towards. We won't include Santa Jaws. Um, no, we don't. And, uh, no. Then you can maybe suggest other movies for us as well. Slacks. <laughs> you know what this makes me think of, though? I haven't said this to you yet, but I've been thinking about this for like a year or two. Is... Alligator people? No. No, I was not thinking about alligator people. God damn it. Um <laughs> Um, you know, in the forties, going to the movies, you see the newsreels and everything while you're waiting for the movie to start, you know, maybe, um, cartoon or something. Um, oh, and also if you get there early enough, Matt sings, let's all go to the lobby, you know, so you'd to get ourselves a treat, what you'd be shocked what happens. You'd be shocked, but, but these times are to get you in early so that you don't start the you so that you don't miss the movie starting at 9 p.m central time so that'd be 10 p.m eastern time this is just about every saturday night so but we do have uh, participants from the uk from canada and mm -hmm. japan so Absolutely. it is quite international it's kind of like this you're watching the movie Plus, and you I, I like italian food so you know we get all over <laughs> europe it's it's sort of like this with cast you can watch the, you, the movie and then on the side chat you can be talking with your fellow uh moviegoers so so it's kind of neat and i appreciate you doing it matt um i'm always advice... interested in more movie suggestions so anybody who's got something along those lines just let me know yeah do you want to give out your phone number um so that people can no all right you can send suggestions to lovecrafteasying at gmail.com. I'll forward them to Matt. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about horror in the high desert, except um, I, I don't know. I'm just really looking forward to this. And I, I w would like, if possible, to get Dutch on the show at some future date after we've seen the movie. So, um, so anyway, do you guys want to say anything about this? Or have I said enough oh i kind of want to see it now yeah. yeah yeah okay along that note um who was it sent us a link one of you guys uh maybe not here on bloody disgusting eight documentary style horror films to pair to pair with howard's mill i think it was de bronzo was it de bronzo yeah sounds like de bronzo uh so first of all what's howard's mill anybody know it's a new uh, show about a place where people disappear apparently under the ground. And there's a really nice couple that goes visiting and the guy's wife vanishes. And then he gets some filmmakers to help him out. Mm. Kind of. Right. Okay. It looks really interesting. It's in the bloody disgusting article. Yeah. It's on my, it's actually on our list of choices this week for movie night. Should I skip the trailer, Bridget? Will no. I like it? Mm -mm. I don't no. think the trailer is going to spoil anything because it 
it basically just sets up that it's a documentary about missing persons. Okay, so again, we're getting into Savage Land and Lake Mungo territory, it sounds like. Kind right? of, they're, both yeah. are, they're both on the list. Yeah. And then it shows like the husband and the wife, and of course the wife disappeared and the husband is a suspect. So, Wait, um, was this, isn't this a Harrison Ford film, Frantic? <laughs> right? Remember, do we remember this? No, but I thought you were going to say Liam Neeson. I will find you and I will kill you. Um, so Howard's Mill is on apparently Tubi. And isn't it available for rent on YouTube? But it's not on Amazon yet. Is that right? Or am I thinking of another movie? Yeah, I think it was only for rent on Tubi and uh, Apple TV when I was looking. I saw YouTube as well, I think. Mm -hmm. But Oh, yeah, right. it's YouTube and Apple. So they're, um, they're listing some more in this article, one called Man Bites Dog, which looks absolutely like nothing I will ever watch. Oh, uh, I'm going to watch it tonight. You are? No. Man Bites Dog. Yeah. Look, I watched House on Haunted Hill, 13 Ghosts, um, Army of the Dead, and Slacks this week. So... Man Bites Dog just sounds like it's right up my alley. <laughs> sounds pretty horrific to me. <laughs> Log now, I would not think I would normally like this sort of thing, but Logan, Danielle, and I, about a year ago, watched the movie Creep. And Jesus Christ, is that creepy. That is one creepy movie. So they're listing Creep 2 in this, which I have not seen. Did you guys like Creep? Did you see Creep? Mm -mm, I didn't see it. I haven't seen it yet. My son keeps saying it's one of the best films he's ever seen. So, so why are you watching alligator people and crap like that instead of creep? <laughs> That's funny. I, I like to watch alligator people because I can talk to you know Pete about it. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe not. watch maybe skip the rewatch this week of uh, the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants and watch Creep. Okay, so you're making fun of it, but. Slacks actually was pretty well acted. It had a pretty good premise. And, you know, it's not a great film, but it's got some song and dance numbers in it. You are right. I'm making fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've not seen Creep 2, but Creep, Creep convinced me. So, you know, I don't know. I want to I hear you guys' opinions on on Creep and Creep 2. All right, I'll get on it. All right, here's a movie that they list, The Bay. Okay. Uh, I watched it. I thought it was a humongous piece of crap. It was okay. It, it wasn't really terrible. It it was I mean, as a marine biologist, I, I saw where it was going. So It, and, was, uh, it was just horrible. All right. They list uh, Lake Mungo, and rightly so. I wish the director of Lake Mungo would do something else. You know, has he not done anything else? No, I don't believe so. He should Are... join a like a monastery to atone for that movie. Matt, I can mute you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. He's, oh, he's got to diss this movie every time. This, I mean, just think about how this movie starts with Alice saying, I feel like something bad is going to happen to me. Actually, I feel like it already has happened. It hasn't reached me yet, but it's on its way. I mean, I mean what? I mean that's <laughs> just greatness right there. Okay, yes, it just if it had been like a twenty-minute short, yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the tunnel. I've not seen this. Anyone seen this? Oh, yeah, we watched. Uh, wait, which tunnel is it? Is it the Australian movie? Yeah, the Australian one. Yeah, we watched uh, that Sydney, on yes. movie night. Who was we, it? we watched it one. It was okay. It's it um I'd say it was uh better than okay. I, I enjoyed it okay. You know, it was So you're saying okay. As, yeah, it wasn't bad, you know. I it, it, well worth a watch. You know, it's not gonna be sticking with too much. Speaking of easy in movie night, you guys watched a movie called The Dead Center last night. How was it? I couldn't stick around. Oh really? Gosh. 
great movie. Was it? Okay. Yeah. The, the, first will of you all, give us, will one of you give a spoiler free synopsis of the dead center? Hmm. Um, yeah. Don't tell about the unicorns, but um, so the script and the acting were all really good and they hardly had any special effects and they hardly needed them. You know, it was about a, a person is it starts off someone's being resuscitated in the emergency room and then they call the code which means they stop the resuscitation because it failed they put his body in the morgue <coughs> and go away and the next thing you know he wakes up and uh, wanders over to the psych ward where he sort of gets checked in accidentally and so as, on it, one as hand, happens yeah on the one hand, you have the medical examiner who's lost this body and now is trying to track down what went on. And on the other hand, you have an overly concerned psychiatrist who is like, can't draw boundaries between himself and his patients, getting sucked in, trying to figure out what's the matter with the guy. And it's just really creepy good. What'd you think, Bridget? Yeah, I thought it was really great. Um there's a line in there where he said, after the fire, after I died, I think something came back with me. Oh, creepy. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'll add that to my list too. And I'm, I'm sure the audience is adding things to the list. In all fairness, guys, some of the stuff we're giving you today is free to watch, like Tubi, Horror in the High Desert. So, um. Okay, so that's the dead center, and you guys are giving that high marks. Um, Just super script, super acting. Okay. Uh, this article also mentions Savage Land, which we don't need to talk about again, but if you've not seen it, definitely watch it. Uh, big thanks to our sometimes panelist, Rich Bunting, for introducing us to this movie, or at least yeah. introducing me to it. No, that was a good, a good recommendation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy uh, to watch it again. Yeah, I would too. Actually, uh, I'm not going to say this right, but Norii, the Curse. Mm, oh, really. that is a great movie. Okay, it's a uh, it's a Japanese movie. And, yeah, uh, I'm I'm starting to delve more and more into Japanese horror and urban legends and so forth and it's just i love it it's scary as hell mm -hmm. what do um, you want to say I, about nori matt okay so i don't think i'm gonna get this screwed up but okay so like there's this there are police officers in this small town and the main character i think is a police officer and they aren't really good at their job you know they're just kind of bumbling they aren't the top detectives you know they aren't funny they're just sort of muddling along and they start coming across these wait strange... a minute is this is this the australian series the night calls no did you see that pete i did it, yes it's only one season but it's, it's... i know i love it though <laughs> well he starts to worry that his daughter is affected somehow by this thing that's going somehow through his community now, okay. was it, I'm, now I'm getting confused. Was it Japanese or Korean? I think it was. Uh, it's Japanese. Yeah, Japanese. Mike, oh, spell I can, Nori I, for me. Huh? Spell Nori for me. N O R O I. I'll read what Bloody Disgusting says. Uh, often gets touted as one of the one of the must see scariest films in found footage horror. I'm learning so much today. In large part due, thanks to Bronzo, in large part due to its faux documentary style. It follows paranormal investigator, I'm not even going to attempt this name, who went missing shortly after completing the documentary. The subject of Kobayashi's mm -hmm. work takes a while to present itself, initially appearing as a series of unrelated par paranormal topics by way of various interviews, field work, and TV clips. Eventually, Kobayashi discovers a connection between these random clips. Deaths seem to follow eccentric recluse Yungo Ishii and her young son everywhere they go. Pulling on that thread, Kobayashi starts unraveling the core mystery 
of a demonic entity named Kagatoba. It's the mythology that keeps viewers in Noriai's grip right up no, until it's exceptional finish. I, oh, I'm man. sorry, Mike. I think I got it confused with another movie. It's okay. I remember hey, really liking out, it, but that I, happens. I, there were, I think I was talking about a Korean movie that we watched, and I forget what that one was. Do you well, I may be watching two movies tonight, Horror in the High Desert and, and Nori I. No, it was it's really good. I, I we've watched several Japanese and Korean horror movies on the movie night, and they've all been quite disturbing. Okay, the last one on their list is S and M. Anyone seen this? Uh, I thought about it, but then I thought I don't know how much I want to watch it. I don't. Yeah. Sometimes I think I can do uh, crystal meth, but then I think better not. Yeah, it looks like it delves into snuff film territory. That that doesn't interest me. All right. So anyway, but there's there's a good list of movies there, guys. So um, to the audience, I hope that gives you something to do. Um, they're doing a Jerusalem's Lot miniseries. Yes, Chapel Wait. Chapel Wait. Uh, did you see the preview? I didn't, but I, I saw it come across my feed. Good. What was your impression then? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I, my question is, why would you change the name? Yes, I thought why that you, too. Because otherwise, you know... This is a Lovecraftian story. This is a very Lovecraftian is, Stephen King story. Right. So why... Unless there's, you know, some fear of getting confused with uh, Salem's lot, but well, well it is well, the same town, isn't it? Well, the recent usage of Jerusalem's lot and Castle Rock. Yeah, yeah. I think they're just trying to redeem themselves from season two of Castle Rock. From every season of Castle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> there are things I liked about the first season. Okay, fair enough. Uh, anyway, I haven't seen the trailer yet, but there is a trailer for Chapel Wait. So, I don't know. I hope they stay in Lovecraftian territory in this. Yeah. So, you know. Actually, it's blocking in territory, if you think about it. Yeah. It's, it's well, different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a lot for Robert Blocks in those stories. And the rest of the walls. All right. I... Uh, I had this on my list, and you mentioned it too, uh, Rick. You want to talk about um, Sisterhood, Dark Tales and Secret Histories, uh, published by Chaosium. Right now it's available only in digital, but I think it's coming out in uh, in uh, print as well. Yeah, this came out like the, uh, the end of the week. Okay. I, I only picked up a copy a day or two ago. So it seems to be an anthology of uh, cosmic horror by female writers. Among the people uh, in the anthology are Gemma Files, S. P. Murkowski, mm -hmm. Livia Llewellyn, Molly Tanzer, Nadia Wilkin, yeah, Damon Angelica Walters. Some really, really good writers. Sorry. I I read two stories. I read uh, SPs and I read uh, Livia's. And Livia's is in the mythos and actually uh, borrows from her uh, story wisdom uh, catalog entry on Joe Pover's uh, rules of rumination <laughs> in an interesting way. Cool. Uh, Livia it, it has a business story, and SP is more cosmic horror. So I think it's going to be that the bulk of the stories are cosmic horror, and a few of them have mythos tidings. I like the, I haven't read any yet, but I like the title of Livia's The Low Dark Edge of Life. Yeah. So anyway, it's put out by Chaosium. I would imagine. You can go to the Chaosium website and search for it, or just Google Chaosium Sisterhood. Or Amazon. 
Yes. I put, I put it off Amazon. Oh, did you? Okay. Well, if you type in just sisterhood in Amazon, you probably won't find it. Type in sisterhood and chaosium. Chaosium, yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you for that, Rick. Um, I'll wait for a, a print copy. Pete Rollick. What? I love you, man. <laughs> Hold on one second. So what? Rick mentioned that um, uh, Livia's story tied into her entry in the in the uh, auction book. This oh book, yeah, Nate Peterson's auction. Book. Nate Peterson is the is the editor of this, so yes, that kind of makes sense. Yep. Yep. So he also announced this forthcoming in the uh, front of the book, uh, Joel Pulver's. Uh, Anthology leaves in the economic album. Which oh, that's it's coming out. It oh, is yeah. coming out. It's coming out. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah when Chaosium makes an announcement like that, it's like cast in stone. Yeah. I sense sarcasm. Never. Okay. Yeah, what I was saying, they seem to be uh, planning to put it out soon. Good. So, Joe was so excited about this, man. I eat talk to me about this for hours yeah all right so anyway as i was about to say pete i love you because okay, you introduced yeah. me to shutter s-u-t-t-e-r s-h-u-t-t-e-r uh, huh s-h-u s-h-u-t-t-e-r yes, yes. not that's not that's not that's shutter that's as in the channel right. shutter as in film right uh 2004 uh, this is a set in Bangkok, is that right? Uh, I think it's Thai. Japanese. It's I don't Thai. Think, yeah, it's not Japanese. I don't think it's Japanese. Oh, is it Thai? Yes. Okay. okay. Anyway. Anyway, do you want to say something spoiler free about this and talk about the. There's a US version I haven't seen. Yes, yeah, so there's a US version um, which you don't need to see. Bridget made a comment that it has like three stars. Um, I don't think it's that bad of a film. It's just that not not that good of a film. I think the the Asian version is much better, and just it is about a husband and wife who have a car accident, and things go south from there. He's a photographer, and and you, and you think it's going to be? I know what you did last summer. Right. That's all and I'll say. Completely different. And it has this wonderful twist ending. Oh my god, that that ending scene is just going to stay with me for a long time. Right? Yeah. And you know, I've seen I, I've seen a lot of Japanese and K horror films, and I think this is one of the better ones. And you know. We tried, we tried to reproduce a bunch of these. We did this with The Ring and The Grudge and, and with Shudder. Um, also, uh, The Eye with Jessica Alba was originally a Korean horror film. And um, I think Shudder is one of the best films I've seen come out of that, that part of the, the world. Uh, just FYI, if you want to watch it, I, I looked for it on Amazon first and it was unavailable, but I found it on Netflix. Okay. So, at, at least as of this moment. But yeah, I really appreciate it, Pete. That's, that's a really good movie. And it, it's really just a very classic ghost story. That, and it, it really does haunt you. I would yeah. almost say it's it's uh, Bensonian. So, there, good film. I liked it. Uh, Kelly Young mentioned a movie called Gen D G I N N. Has anyone seen that yet? Sorry, Gen. The Gen. I don't know how you say oh, it. The Gen. No, the Gen. Okay. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Um. It's like seven bucks to rent on Amazon. I guess oh. I'm waiting. Yeah. P. Uh, well, I mean, Kelly loved it. So, okay. But I've got other movies to watch that aren't seven dollars. Right. So. I will put both of those on the possible list. There you go. Um, what else we got here? Oh, you also mentioned a movie called 
Cairo, K A I R O. And you yeah, said Shudder okay. was superior to it, but that it was a good movie. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's also known as The Pulse. Yeah, um, two thousand one. Yeah, and there's and once again there was an American remake of that as well. Um, Cairo is sort of a classic techno paranoia film. In in many ways, it it uh, pre echoes uh, Stephen King's Cell. Mm. Um, and uh, it's kind of low budget, but they work with some with what they've got, and uh, you know I think they they managed to do a pretty good job. And uh, I, Phil I, Phil Jones says Cairo is my favorite film. Incredible! Don't bother with the U.S. version. There you Wait, go. Well, what's what's the real go. name of it? I don't. Uh, K A I R O. Oh. Kiro, okay. Oh, Kiro? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, plot summary says, two groups of people discover evidence that suggests spirits may be trying to invade the human world through the internet. Yeah, that's okay. it. So this is 20 years old, but I mean, you know, I respect Phil's opinion too, so. No, um, I, I, have, I, yeah, go ahead. You know, like... Uh, so 20 years ago, I was watching a lot of J&K horror and, you know, that was one, of the, I think, one of the highlights. I mean, we, once again, we imported what I think of as, as some very simple tropes. The, the, the hair over the face woman was easily, you know, was easily identifiable in the grudge and the ring. Mm -hmm. all that. And those are, that's a pretty standard Asian monster spirit, um, vengeful ghost image. These other ones, like I say, I think Cairo predates Stephen King's cell. And you know, he beats him to the punch very early. Um, well, I was on the fence until Phil made that remark. So I'll, I'll keep it on my list. Um, let's see here. Uh... Rick, I think you wanted to, and then we'll go back to some more scary movies. Hulu's comedic Marvel series, Modoc. Modoc. Want to talk about that? Ten half hour episodes. It's done in the style of uh, Robot Chicken, <laughs> and it's very funny. Okay. It has an interesting storyline, even though it's not that they take seriously. It involves time travel, by the way. Oh, does it? Yes. Nice. So, yeah, Modoc was just one of... He was... I could never take him serious as a villain because he just looks so ridiculous. And I think that they've, they've basically gone with that to do this version of him. My favorite episode is when he tries to hang out with other villains. Yeah. He gets blackboard from the elite... Uh, Supervillain Club by Mr. Sinister and the leader. Um, Brandon Young wants to know if, if we talked about the numbers. We have talked about the numbers in other episodes, and I think we gave it thumbs down, didn't we? So, I haven't watched any of them. I just watched I, the first episode and I couldn't get it. I there, finished, there you go. I finished the third episode today. Oh, you did? Okay, so what, what are your thoughts? I thought it was getting a bit more interesting. There's definitely a lot more um, a war brewing, I guess I'll say. It's very coming up very X-Men of the yes. mutants versus the, you know, the society that wants everything to be normal. Um, it was pretty brutal, this episode. I'm, I'm interested. I'm not necessarily loving it, but uh, it's interesting. Well, you know, you're young. I have a limited amount of time in my life, so I have to <laughs> pick and choose wisely. <laughs> Are you like 28 or something like that? So I've watched all the episodes. Okay, I'll take it, I guess. <laughs> you watched all the, all the episodes and what's the verdict? Oh, my so, God. Of course you have. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to agree with Bridget that if I were Marvel, I would be... 
given this the side eye to yeah to uh joss whedon because we're all given the side eye to joss whedon for various reasons yeah. these days <laughs> this is very x-men mm-hmm. and i i turned on episode six this week and it was a completely different show it was a post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. war show. You know who you remind me of? You remember the movie version of of uh, uh, Doctor Manhattan? I'm blanking on the yeah on the title. You know where he he can split himself into different versions of himself, so he can do, get different things done. Yeah. You know. So is that your power? Is that how you see so many things? Do you, I, is this what you do? Yes. Okay, that's what Listen, I thought. You know, I watch a lot of media, but I, you know, I multitask. My brain is weird that way. But so anyway, go going back to the Nevers episode. Watchmen. Six, sorry, I can't believe I blanked on that. Episode okay. six is a completely different show. Mm-hmm. It's set in the future in which the world is the world is at war with itself, and it finally ties back into the extra dimensional aliens and what's happening in Victorian England but it's the same thing that he did in Dollhouse where you you know, suddenly you were jumped 20 years or 50 years into the future and then you came back you guys are really talking me out of seeing this it, I, <laughs> it's a, it's not that bad it's <laughs> You're it's really... interesting. You know, just like you should watch it, Mike. It's not that space. bad. I mean, <laughs> literally, one of the main characters is essentially Kitty Pride from Days of Future Past. Um, the comic book series. You know, she. I think we've killed this horse All enough. Right, yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, Rush Patel says, "Have you see, folks seen seen Eramentari? I don't know. I've never even heard of it. That's a fantastic film. That's the animated one that's in black and white. No. Turkish. No, it's a, uh, uh, forgive me. I think it's a Spanish film. It's color, but it's. Oh, very, yeah, it's a, era, yeah. Okay. Very mythology, mythological. Um, yes. Very stylish. If only yes. there was some way we could look this up. Um, <laughs> I've got it pulled up. Yeah. It's, it's, got a, it's a great it's, movie. Yeah, it's it's um. He says it's Spanish. It's Spanish, yes. Okay, so I was right the first off. On Netflix, um, he says. It's beautifully done. Okay, all right. Is this a horror film, sci-fi film? Where uh, I mean, I hate to label everything, but. Uh, I, would, I would say it's more fable, yeah. fable like. Yeah. Dark uh, fantasy fable. Yes. yes. Okay. I like that. Uh, yeah. Sort of, sort of Faustian. Yep. I would go with that. Okay. All right. And it's it's worth a watch. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is that it's it's dubbed, or no, I'm sorry, not dubbed. It's subtitled, and you know you just you have to pay attention to it. Well, so is Shutter, and I loved it. Yeah, I mean, that's not a big deal. Hey, I have, well, I have to subtitle English shows because I'm half deaf. Yeah. There's a lot of imagery though in the Aramantari, so I I can see what Pete's saying because obviously we watch a lot of subtitle movies, but there's a um it, it i guess there are some animation type things in it but there's some very visual things and so you're trying to digest the visual storytelling with the subtitles right yeah another movie i, I may have mentioned last week but i'll just mention again is called fragile stars Callista flockhart i saw it about eight years ago with danielle at night in a farmhouse with nothing else around and it was pretty creepy. Uh, I think I'm going to give it a rewatch. Uh, but it was it was good, really good. I also want to mention um, Scott Thomas's Sea of Ash, Ash, which, as you guys know, I published uh, about seven years ago after discovering it. Um, and then a couple of years later, I... I commissioned Lehman Kessler to do an audio version of, of this. Uh, and I don't know if you've listened to it, Bridget, but um, mm-hmm. you have? Yep. 
How, did you like the, the intro and the outro music? Yes. That was all me. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's I, you deliberately keep it simple. It's supposed to be not detracting from the story. Right. But I, I love it when audiobooks do that. I don't like it when they do it in the middle of the story. Mm -hmm. But putting you in that mood right at the beginning. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of campy when it shows up in the middle or in between chapters. Yeah. Well, first of all, right now, Sea of Ash is 99 cents on Kindle. And I'm not going to leave it there. I'm going to change that this week sometime. I I'll give it two weeks for those who are listening later in their cars and so forth. If you have not read The Sea of Ash, this is one of the most uh, magical is just too generic a term. Uh, I'm not trying to make myself money here. Always trying to make Scott money here. I mean, look, small press publishers do not get rich on books that they publish, okay? <laughs> um but the experience of reading it is it, it's unlike any book i've ever read it's a novella so it's not a long read um you can go to amazon and read the comments uh on it and you don't have to take my word for it and um then lehman just brings this whole new aspect to it um there are three three men in three different centuries and the and the guy in the 21st century is sort of following in the footsteps of the two that came before, trying to discover things, this, kind of, this, this possible world behind the world in New England, I guess is the best way, way to put it. Anyway, just look it up on Amazon. It's called The Sea of Ash by Scott Thomas. It's 99 cents on Kindle. And uh, do download it on Audible if you've, yeah, I think it's like five bucks. It's not much. So um, I wanted to give that an extra push because I am going to make that price change soon. Sorry, what, Bridget? I was saying, get it, get it. It's totally worth, it. <laughs> it's worth reading. It's an yeah. awesome story. So I, yeah. did anybody besides me break down and watch Army of the Dead? No. Oh. And then we won't talk about it. Was it any good? I mean, I like Zack Snyder, but it, it's, I'm fucking it's, sick of zombies. It's not a bad movie. It's a popcorn film. It borrows heavily from, I would say, Peninsula, The Girl with All the Gifts, Jurassic Park. Um, oh, Girl with All the Gifts. Got, uh, Mike's got a, Mike Carey's got a new book set in that world, by the way. Really? Yeah. So anyway, sorry, but go on. Oh, no. I digress. You know, you digest? Digress. Oh, okay. But I also do digest. So um, there are some people have suggested that these are trioxin zombies, and I can see, you know, from Return of the Living Dead. And I can see why they think that. So I don't know what that means. That's I I've heard he, he used versions of all types of zombies. Yeah, there's, there's uh, all types of zombies. Yeah, like it was one third Night of the Living Dead, one third uh, Return of the Living Dead, right, and one third, oh. uh, and one third that uh, uh, that World War sort of movie with uh, World War Z. Yeah, World War Z. Yeah. All right, the, here's the question, Pete: Did you love it? I didn't love it. I think Dave Batista does a nice job in it. I can see why he chose to do it. He, it's it's actually you know a, a reach for him to to work to do this film. He's, there's some very nice scenes in it for him. All right, I respect Alan Hughes' opinion too, and he says I saw it. It was okay. I don't think it will hold up. Yeah, I, th you know, I think he's talking about Army of the Dead and not this show. So you yeah, know, well, we'll assume. I, I think it will be ultimately. <laughs> I th I, like I said, it's very derivative of some other things. Um, Isn't every zombie movie derivative? No, 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 no. I think Girl with All the Gifts was a complete revamp of the... Of the That's movie. true. That's true. Um, That's true. So, so yeah. Um, I think there's also a, a nod at some point to Will Smith's I Am Legend. Oh, God. Which had not happened. So... Kelly Young was always like, Oh man, I know you hate zombies. You hate zombie movies, but you got to watch Train to Busan. You got to watch Train to Busan. Busan. It's different. Awesome. Train to Busan is great. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree. I watched it with Danielle and Logan and we're like, it's zombies on a train. Yeah. Okay. So heart wrenching. On their way to Lake Mungo. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay yeah all right so another zombie movie that pete likes is do i have this right the taking of film film one two three oh no that's uh that's uh i'm thinking of a different film yeah. why don't you talk about the taking of pelham one two three pete and bring this into reality the real reality because i think it's, it's interesting and i actually looked you up on wikipedia and and yeah, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, so the, I, taking of, the taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, it, first of all, it's been made into a film three times. Uh, first time for theaters, second time for television, and third time with um, John Travolta. And <laughs> the thing about this book is when it came out and when they made the film, uh, it was at the height of the uh, hijacking craze late 60s early 70s where people would get onto a plane with a gun hijack it get their demands met and and fly to cuba like that was going to solve all their problems right so this guy who doesn't want to live in cuba right um this guy flips the script on this and says okay we're going to hijack a subway train and they hijack one car out of um, uh, a subway train that leaves, uh, I think it's Pelham Bay Park Station at 123. So You're speaking of this 1974 film. In yeah. New York City. Yeah. Yeah, in New York City. And now, at the time, New York City is on the verge of bankruptcy, The and there's corruption scandals. So, you know, when they ask for a million dollars, it's a lot of money for the for the city to come up with. And so apparently also um, during the filming, uh, it took them months to negotiate any rights to actually film in the subway system. The, the, uh, the, the transportation authority did not want anything to do with this movie. Um, they were afraid that it would cause a whole bunch of crazy people to start hijacking trains um they call they use the word kooks um but you know the film is really good it uh uh, stars a couple great actors um i thought it was ernest borgnine it's not the the big name in the film is walter matthau uh, walter matthau who actually went into the tunnels of the real subway system and came out and he talked about listen there are microbes that people have never discovered down there yet still. And there are insects and roaches the size of, of small cats. Um, he was just freaked out by the whole experience. And then a couple decades later, there was a movie with that starring Mara Savino. Yes. But anyway, um, I saw this film back in the 70s, you know, when it first came on television after the theater release, which you know used to happen years to months, months to years later. And it's on, I think, Turner Classic on, H- on the HBO Max hub now as a, uh, as a uh, classic film. I watch it again and you know, it really stands up as a nice taut thriller. Robert but Shaw I, plays the bad guy. Robert Shaw, yes, thank you. Uh, in an excellent, excellent uh, per- performance. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think what Mike wants, wants me to get to is the fact that after this film was made for years afterwards, there was a sort of unwritten policy that the train schedulers would not let any train leave Pelham Bay's park station at 123. They did actually, the Wikipedia articles actually goes further and says the New York City Transit Authority banned, banned any schedule of a train leaving this station at 1.23 a.m. or 1.23 p.m. Well, there you go. 
And then for years afterwards, it was still kept in place, but unofficially. They yeah. just didn't want to encourage this concept yeah. or anybody to take advantage of it. Um, and it, it's not a horror film. It's, it's more of a, a, first of all, I think the, the one of the, it's the Hector Alonso is in it. Um, and he was just, he's just magnificent uh, as, as a psyched, psyched out killer. Um, but it's not a horror film. There are some horrific moments, but ultimately I, I think it's a really good psychological thriller um, that is worth watching. Um, what else do you want me to say, Mike? That's it. It's got, some, it's, that was interesting. it's got some good humor in it too. It does. My favorite line is, I think it's the mayor's wife. The yeah. mayor is debating whether to pay the ransom for the 20 hostages. And, oh yes, uh, yes. And it, it, it echoes to it echoes later. She's like, you know, if you pay this, you, you know what you're gonna get? 20 people that are absolutely gonna vote for you. Yeah. And it, it's like, oh, that's you know, that's very similar to the line in Ghostbusters. Lenny. Lenny. I was about to say, you will have saved the lives of millions of potential voters. Yep. Um, and you know, there's a lot of, of faces in this film that you will recognize. Uh, the, the mayor's wife is is played by is a very young version of the woman who plays uh, the the Doris in um, Everybody Loves Raymond. Um, uh, the head of the TA who's scheduling all the trains is uh, Jerry uh, from Seinfeld. Um, George's father. Oh, really? Oh, uh, uh, maybe. Stiller. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Jerry Stiller. Yeah, um, yeah. and it's so um, you, you can see a lot of people you would recognize from this film who are very young and who we've grown up with. Anyway, it, it's, it's a good film. I, I recently watched and I was really, really impressed how much it's, it's held together. Um, any other movies you want to mention before we go? So I've been watching on Shudder with my daughter. We've watched um, how, the original House on Haunted Hill mm -hmm. and then 13 Ghosts. Is the original? The originals. And she absolutely loves William Castle films. She, she, they, she's like, they had the perfect mix of horror and humor in them. Is, is you show it tingly yet? That's the next one on my list. But in doing the research on what films I should show her, I did not know that he was involved in The Exorcist. So we think of William Castle as this guy that just made really bad films. But he mortgaged his house and bought the rights of, from the for the William Peter Blatty book, The Exorcist, and thought that he was going to make this film, and he ended up producing it. He wanted to direct it, but the studio that he eventually had to partner with uh, picked Roman Polanski instead. But, no, uh, uh, William Friedkin. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I was thinking Rose. Yeah. Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby. But yes. Yeah. William Friedkin. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah. He um, he was seriously involved in in that film and just you, he thought that was going to jumpstart his career and make him a, a serious filmmaker. And of course, it didn't. He never really achieve that kind of status. He had a, a TV series and a felony series launched after that. I think one title was Ghost Story and then it became uh, Circle of Fear. Okay. And, it, and it was promoted as being from the producer of The Exorcist. Yeah. So we did cap, try to capitalize on that. Right. Uh, okay, I think 
What else? Yeah. What else you got, Mike? Well, I had an article about watching. Um, oh, here it is. It's at allure.com. And the title of the article is Why Watching Scary Movies May Help Your Anxiety. And I won't read the whole article, but here's a blurb. Scary movies pop up. Scary movies create a situation where the worry becomes focused on something separate from yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I can see that. So um, if you're interested if you're in the audience and you're interested in reading this, um, just go to Allure, and um, it's a it's a couple years old. Uh, it was written for Halloween in 2018, I think. So, so anyway, um, let's see who do we have next week. Oh, right, the long suffering Bo Johnson. Um, Who's Bo Johnson? Bo Johnson is a writer who has a couple of books out so far and I don't know if you think of if you think of Laird Barron's uh, mystery series um, maybe in that class uh, this is just hardcore crime slash horror stuff um, and uh, I, I think one of the uh, um, one of the reviews says that Bishop Ryder could kick the shit out of Jack Reacher. So uh, I'm reading the first one, A Better Kind of Hate, and it's it's really, really good. And it's not, the thing is, it, it's it's weird, and it's weird in a, way, in, in a good way. It's not, it's not a novel. It's a collection set in the same universe. So like in the first story, you've got Bishop Ryder, uh, I don't know, taking revenge on somebody, if I remember correctly, for something. And on the next one, you've got some mob boss um, doing something really horrible to his hired help because of something they've done. In the next story, you got Bishop Ryder at 70 years old, you know, in a story. And it just it flip flops back and forth. It's, it's really neat. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so Bo Johnson, that's uh, B-E-A-U. And um, as always, you can go to, love, to the Lovecraft Easy website, click on podcast on the top left, and then scroll down. Excuse me, you'll see the uh, guests coming up, and they're all hyperlinked. So, you know, you can, you can see their books. A Better Kind of Hate, and then the second book is All of Them to Burn. So... So anyway, and uh, June 13, Trevor Henderson and Judd Shepard. Judd Shepard of Host, the director of Host, and Trevor Henderson, who's a, a really, really creepy artist who's... who's uh, Maybe got, got an really artist of creepy things. Yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> Trevor, you're really creepy. He'd probably take it. He's a nice guy. Um, I threatened to kill you in public. <laughs> Commas matter. Yes. Commas matter. So, all right. Anything else, guys, before we go? Yeah, just a couple things. So, this is just in general. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, you all know the Necronomicon has been postponed from this summer till hopefully next summer. They've canceled ticket sales, but they will supposedly open for the following summer on December 1st. Okay, so there's that. The reason I'm mentioning this um, is that there was an art exhibit taking place at the Norman Rockwell Museum, roughly two hours east of Providence in Massachusetts, called Enchanted and is a history of fantasy art. And I was sort of planning to go to the Enchanted exhibit while I was in Providence. Um, the reason I mentioned this exhibit, well, first of all, there's a really great book of fantasy art that accompanies it, but it's got a couple paintings by Bob Eggleton, including a really magnificent Cthulhu that hasn't otherwise been published yet. So if you happen to be in that region of Massachusetts and you're looking for 
something artsy to do, there's a great Bob Eggleton Cthulhu painting you could go see. Wow. And then the other thing is, what was mentioned kind of at the beginning of the show is our convention fix, maybe not completely eliminated this summer. We have not yet heard from the HP Lovecraft Film Festival as to whether they're actually gonna have in-person uh, seating. It was canceled last year because uh, they have it at this old timey theater. <clears throat> at its maximum, the old timey theater can accommodate like 1200 people. So they can't sell any more tickets than that. But if they had opened it, I think the rule in Portland at the time was they could have like 50 people in the building. You know, so what was the point? So they streamed it all. They'll probably stream this one too. Uh, if you just keep your eyes peeled to the HPL uh, Film Festival website or the Ezine website, we'll let you know as soon as we hear whether it's going to be uh, in person or not. Yeah, Matt's really good about keeping on top of that stuff and, and letting us know. Um, hey, yeah. I have one more thing I want to talk about. Yes, please. John Steinbeck. Okay, yeah, we should always talk about him. So first of all, John Steinbeck is like one of my favorite writers. Uh, I just I love Cannery Row, but more important. Oh, oh God, that's a that is that scene where they're buying beer with frogs. It's just <laughs> I every time I read that I'm like on the floor laughing. Yeah, and it's you know if you don't want to read something humorous, just pick up East of Eden and read it through. Yeah, it's brilliant. But. John Steinbeck, before he hit it big as, you know, America's author of the Depression, he wrote several other novels that did not sell, and most of them he destroyed. But one of them that still exists is his werewolf novel. Oh, that's interesting. He, John Steinbeck wrote a werewolf mystery novel. The Howls of Wrath? <laughs> I actually forget what it's called, but um, everyone, and, and it's the, the Steinbeck's literary agents have it. It's in the archives. They're being begged to release it. And the, the agents are saying, well, no, no, he didn't publish it we're going to respect his wishes. And Steinbeck scholars are, are coming back and saying, he tried to get it published. Let's read it. And so this is, but I really would love to see a Steinbeck werewolf novel. Well, that's, well taking, the, taking the example of Harper Lee, you just have to wait till the conscientious family members are dead and then they'll publish anything. Yeah, that's true. Interesting. But, you know, it's, it would be sort of like finding out that, you know, uh, I don't know, pick something. It, it would be like being in the uh, Ur novella by Stephen King. Yeah, but like Hemingway would write a, like a Frankenstein novel or something like that. And, right, right. But, yeah. But, speaking, you know, what? Go ahead. I was just going to say, speaking of werewolves, novels so finish what you're talking about this one first <laughs> oh so i was just thinking you know, well could, because i think it has actually value in saying look you know not everything you write as a writer is going to get published mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't have good ideas but that that doesn't mean that you should stop you that doesn't and, mean it was a bad we don't know if it was a bad werewolf exactly novel. we don't know mm -hmm. Maybe they just didn't want to publish something in that genre for, of his at the time for right. Right. reasons. Who knows? Exactly. It could, we could come back and find out that it is like the Grapes of Wrath of werewolf novels. It's right. that good. But we'll never, we won't know until they release it. Yeah. So, all right. Anyway, Bridget, what were you I saying? Was just, I was going to ask Mike if he listened to The Wolfen yet because. I'm in the middle of it. I am too. I have a couple hours left. I really like it though. Yeah. I, I have not um, been a huge reader of werewolf novels over the years. I've read a lot of vampire novels, but 
um, I'm really enjoying this novel. I didn't expect it to be a police procedural kind of thing and or for the main characters to be police officers, but I'm really enjoying it. Is anybody yeah. watch the second season of Love, Death, and Robots? It's on my list. Okay. I haven't even watched the first I season. I keep hearing about certain episodes. There's two Lovecraftian episodes. And then there's one cosmic horror episode that at the end that I think cool. will be overlooked, which I think is probably the most powerful piece there is. But yeah. Uh, okay. Here's something Laura, Lawrence Block said. You were just talking about writing just now, Pete. Made me think of this. And I was looking up the quote. Uh, Lawrence Block, as maybe many who have been watching this show for years or listening know that I love his Matthew Scudder uh, crime series. Anyway, quote from Lawrence Block. One thing that helps is to give myself permission to write badly. I tell myself that I'm going to do my five or ten pages no matter what and that I can always tear them up the following morning if I want. I'll have lost nothing. Writing and tearing up five pages would leave me no further behind than if I took the day off. It kind of goes in line with write, write, write. And maybe 75% of it's crap. Get rid of the crap and keep the gold, you know? Yeah, Joe, well, Joe would talk about is like just, just write the novel and then you can go back and fix it. All right, writing is rewriting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So tonight I'm going to watch Horror in the High Desert and Norio. Am I saying that right? Yeah. yeah you, you won't you regret that one. I really liked it. Okay. Uh, last but not least, if you're not a patron, I hope you'll consider it. Uh, there's different levels starting at five dollars a month. You get to, even at five dollars a month, you get Patreon podcasts that the public doesn't get to see. Um, at ten dollars a month, you can you get other things like Kindle books and and um, get to hang out with us panelists twice a month and a non-recorded just hanging out. I have permission from one of my ten dollar a month patrons, uh, Alan Smalling to quote this uh speaking of one of our non-recorded shows and p again you made me think of this when and matt when you guys were talking about necronomicon uh he said i had a great time last night i've been watching the lovecraft easy team on youtube for at least a year and have enjoyed their discussions and recommendations it was such a treat to get to speak to mike davis pete rollick matthew carpenter Rick Lay, Ben, and other patrons. I think this is a little bit for your time, Bridget. I'm, I'm not trying to sound too fanboyish, but this is a great Patreon perk. Not only can you ask questions, but you can laugh along with the group. They are very entertaining, informative, and well educational. I assume they're speaking about Rick there. That he's speaking mm -hmm. about Rick there. Uh, what a great resource if you want to learn about horror. Uh, strange fiction, pulps, and behind-the-scenes views. Last night, was kind of a mini Necronomicon for me. It was about an hour and a half to two hours of really enjoyable conversation. To me, I wouldn't put a price tag on it. I just enjoyed it. For a Patreon pledge of $10 to get a chance to speak to a group of very interesting authors and editors and publishers uh, is a no-brainer. So thank you, Alan. And um, Did you pay him to write that? No, he paid me. Ten dollars a month. So I was gonna say he said you can't put a price on it, but you sure as hell do. Yeah. <laughs> so it, he's, in he's, fairness, <laughs> I put the price on it before he wrote the note. <laughs> so this last thing that this last one we did, I mean, we spent at least thirty minutes, thirty to forty-five minutes on you know Godzilla's excretory functions. It wasn't that long. Yes, it was. It, it, oh my yes. god. Yes, it was. Everybody's like, all right, I was considering it, but forget it. You know. And I, this is I, important stuff. I had to miss this great conversation because I had, I had to go to the dentist. Yeah. Yeah. Rick had a root canal. So I just think that it's important that we pin, pin things down, you know? Well, you know, we can't have an Economicon right now, but we can do this kind of stuff. So uh, thank you to all the Patreons, whatever level you're on. Uh, hey. If you like Victor Lavelle and respect his opinion, Victor Lavelle has given me his permission to tell everybody that he is a patron and uh, that he gets a lot out of the show. So 
we, um, you know, this, we, we went yes. through this whole show and we didn't mention that the new, the uh, confirmation of the Doctor Strange villain. Uh, it will be Shumagora. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm really looking forward to this movie, actually. When does this come out? I think in Ulti- two years. Two years? Uh, in two years? Shumagora? But in, is um I don't want to Marvel's Lovecraftian monster. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't want to slap I'm not a Marvel expert and I don't want to slap a Lovecraftian label on everything, but I'm really looking forward to this because it looks Lovecraftian, it looks yeah. cosmic horror. And he's even taken from uh Robert E. Howard's Hyporian mythology. Yeah. So well, if you want to keep the easing projects and podcasts going, just just I've got the link in the show notes, or you can just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon. So I appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everybody who watches live and later and who listens later. Um, yes, your prize, Matt. Uh, yes, not my prize, the prize you could win. Two copies, two books, one each of Crypto Critters Volume 1, Crypto Critters Volume 2. Send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put crypto in the subject heading. In a month or so, someone is going to win these. And Matthew Carpenter's wife thanks you very much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, thanks, everybody, and especially thanks to you guys for being here every Sunday. I really appreciate it. And we will see everyone next week with uh, Bo Johnson. So thanks a lot. Have a good night, folks. <laughs>